All right, we're recording now. So I guess the first thing to remind you is if you're online, make sure you send me the, the attendance words before 9 a.m. And I guess I'll just continue doing what I started last week, which is those of you in person, if you feel like it, you can send me the attendance words too for a little bit of action put it on your uh, attendance. So speaking of which, the first word for attendance would be turkey, since we just finished Thanksgiving. Um, so for announcements, let's remind, uh, remind you, it's the same thing I've been saying actually for the past few weeks. I, for the most part, took the week off. I kind of had to, though, because the kids that were off from school, so I didn't do much grading. Um, I did eventually get to emails, what, actually on Thanksgiving Day. So anybody who had something pressing, I was able, I think, I was able to email me back and, and get, get things going. But for grading, as far as grading is concerned, I haven't graded anything, so I'm really behind. So I just wanted to let you know that's why. Um, oh yeah, and because of that, thank you for you the lab. Remember I was saying this week, this week you don't have to have a new lab and you don't, and I was saying I was just gonna pick your lowest grade for your this week's grade, and that way you give you an incentive to fix your lowest grade. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm still gonna pick a grade, but this time I'll pick your highest grade. Just to make things a little bit easier for you, because maybe you've got finals coming up. So if you, you're fine with your highest grade, you have nothing to do. You still can. You still, in my opinion, you should take this week for lab and go fix your old labs, you know, to help you grade. But you don't have to. I'm going to pick your highest lab grade, and I'm going to repeat it. So again, if you have any questions as far as which one's your highest lab, or what you can do to fix your highest lab grade, assuming it's not a, you know, perfect score, then let me know. Any questions about that? What else? I guess that's it. You know, it's pretty simple now. We've got one week left. You know, last week, and then after this, is finals. Our finals are going to be on Monday. It's just going to be like everything else. It'll be online. It's going to open up at eight and close what at ten fifty. I think it's going to be more time. I'll send all this out in writing, but yeah. But as always, since even though the finals are going to be online, if you want to take it in person and take a paper version, let me know. Or if you want more time to take it, remember, let me know beforehand so we can find the time to meet online and I can see you in your screen and hear you to make sure you take it both ways. I have no problem extending the time to the time. Any questions about anything? Good your time. It's 8 a.m. Uh, I know you guys came in after I start talking, but you're on time. So do you mind emailing me just to make sure to remind me that you're here on time? Yes. All right, let's jump in back into chapter 20. So we pretty much finished the first main bullet point on Friday, which was talking about biodiversity and why it's so important and not really is important. It reminds you of biodiversity is basically the variety of life on Earth, whether you're talking about a single species or talking about the, the gene pool of that species, or if you're talking about you know all the living creatures in a particular ecosystem, or even if you're just talking about all the ecosystems on Earth. Biodiversity is important. Um, not just because we like the environment, but because literally it's a matter of life and death, uh, because we need ecosystems to function so we can live, but also we do make a lot of money off of ecosystems too. So basically, that's in a nutshell what we talked about with that first bullet point. Now we're moving on to the second bullet point to talk about community ecology. The first thing you need to know is what a community is, and you need to know this for the exam. I mentioned it before, but this is the first time I'm actually officially giving you the definition in writing. A community is an assemblage of species living close enough together for potential interaction. You need to know that. But again, like I always said, it's not that you need to know that verbatim. You need to understand what that means. So keep in mind what we talked about previously in chapter 19 was a population. A population is a group of organisms of the same species that are living close enough to interact, right? They're interbreeding, they're competing over the same resources. That's a population. And the, the, the um, an example I keep using is the squirrels on WBSU's campus, right? That's a population of squirrels. They're the same species. They're here dealing with the same, you know, stresses. They're fighting over the same resources, competing over the same resources. And that's a population, right? Unlike the, uh, the, the separate population of squirrels in Canal State Forest, right? They're separate. Anyway, so that's a population. And then again, a step up from a population. It's a lot like a population. The community is a lot like a population, except now we're not just considering the one species. We're considering all the species. Um, so, for example, we were talking about a population in this room. Well, for what we can see, we would be talking about all the humans, right? But if we were talking about the community in this room, 
And we talk about all of us humans, but we talk about all the maybe some mold that's in the air or you know the gut bacteria that we have, all the different species, even though we don't have zucchinis right now, there are all species in this room. So then the question is about what a community is. All right, this picture is a great example of a community, it's a very familiar one. I'm sure if you've watched any nature shows, you've seen this. So we have this zebra that was just killed by that lion, right? That was an example of predation because that thing's killing it to eat it. That thing, the lion's also competing against these scavengers, which are the vultures and the hyenas, all of which are going to poop after they eat, and that's going to fertilize the ground. And that, you know, is going to make the grass grow. The zebra's going to eat that. The whole circle of life, right? So you can imagine how all these things are interacting, or how all these things interact. It's a great example of a community. And speaking about how all those things interact, that brings us to this. Interspecific interactions. Hopefully you remember last time we mentioned something, um, last chapter I talked about intraspecific interactions, which is interactions between the same species. Now we're talking about interspecific reaction, interactions, and you need to know what those are. Interspecific interactions are interactions between species. So again, we were looking at how that lion is competing with that hyena, right? That would be an interspecific interaction. Or how that lion ate the zebra, interspecific, right? Those are two different species interacting. Um, and then the picture here, I don't know if you can tell what that is. That's a picture of I-64, the Interstate 64 that runs right here behind us. So if you can't remember the inter is between species, so if you can remember interstates takes you between states, right? Anyways, those are these interspecific interactions are classified according to their effects on population concern. And you'll see what I mean, but for example, I've already described it, I just didn't give you the term when I said the lion ate the zebra, right? That's a, an example of predation. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But are there any questions so far? Right, so I'll go ahead and do the second word for attendance, which will be species. All right, there's no need to write anything down from this next slide. It's still an introduction to what I'm about to teach you, which is like a big, broad um, classification. So we'll talk about these inter specific interactions, where these different species are interacting with themselves. So it's either going to be negative for both, positive for both, or positive for one and negative for the other. So for example, the lion that killed the zebra, do you think that would be A, B, or C, the lion that killed the zebra? Which example do you think this would be? Okay. C, right? Positive for one, negative for the other, right? It's good for the lion because it got to eat the, the uh, zebra. Bad for the zebra because it got killed, all right? So anyway, yeah, that's just an example. And again, there's nothing to write this down, no need to write this down, because for the exam, it won't be like this. It's not going to be positive, 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 negative, or negative, negative. There's actually other examples within these. So for example, this, that positive, negative, what I was just talking about would be an example of predation. Um, another thing would be like if uh, the zebra eating plants, right? That would be a positive, negative, positive for the zebra, negative for the plants. That's called herbivory. And that would fall under this category. But for the exam, we're not gonna we're not gonna talk about positive, 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 negative, or negative, negative. It's just a big overview. Are there any questions so far? All right, let's get into it. The first one you need to know <coughs> is interspecific competition. So not interspecific interactions, because interspecific interactions is a big umbrella term that covers all these things: mutualism, predation, herbivory, parasitism, commensalism, all that. This is a very specific um, subcategory, interspecific competition. And as you might guess, it's just competition between species. So again, using the same example I've been using. That lion killed the zebra, but then the hyenas were coming up, and so were the vultures, right? So they're in competition for that same resource, which was the dead zebra. And in these situations, population growth is limited by the population densities of the competing species. But also the density of your own population. I'll put an X to that, not because you don't need to know it, but just because I go into here too, I'm probably not going to get that specific on the exam. But this is, it makes sense, right? What we're saying is like if your population is competing against a different population, it's a game of numbers usually, right? So it's almost like a war with humans. The more people you have, 
generally speaking, you know, the better off you are. Same thing here. So, it does get a little bit more complicated because that seems really basic. I like that your group talks about this and says, you know, what determines if populations will compete? So, obviously, the example I gave, you know, that was obvious, right? We know that the lion is competing against the hyenas and the vultures, but sometimes it's not so obvious, right? So, like, for example, can anybody tell me what population here at WBSU is competing against the squirrels? Right? It's complicated, right? Especially since I wasn't specific and said, were they competing for? We're we talking about competing for water, we're we talking about competing for hiding places, are we talking about competing for food? But moving forward, to understand that concept, there's some other concepts you need to understand. The first one is something called an ecological niche or niche, pronounce either way. And that is an organism's total use of a biotic and abiotic resources. Again, using the squirrels as an example, you could say that WVSU's campus is their habitat, because that's where they live. And in a sense, that's what, to me the best way to remember it, even though it's not 100% accurate, you could think of their ecological niche as their job. What do they do, right? But yes, we know physically they live on WVSU's campus, but it's everything. So it's like, what do they eat? What do they drink? Where do they hide? What temperature range do they like? What humidity range do they like? All these things. But your book has a book, or excuse me, the book example is something called a barnacle. You guys know what barnacles are? You ever seen the bottom of a ship or like a, a dock under the water lines? You know those fuzzy things growing on it? That's a barnacle. So they're aquatic animals. Uh, your book is talking about two different genuses of barnacles that live side by side. One of them, right, if we talk about the niche, we're talking about the spaces of the rock where it lives, right, because they don't always live on the same area. Um, the food, again, sort of like the squirrels, right, what does it eat? And again, the climatic conditions. What is it like for the water temperature? What is it like for the air temperature? Uh, what kind of humidity does it like? A lot of stuff that your book didn't even list, probably, like uh, how sal the salinity of the water, things like that. And the other niche, or for the, the niche for the other genus of barnacles, is the same as this one, is the original, except it can't survive as high above the low tide. In other words, here we have two different genuses of barnacles. They're very similar. They're basically fighting for the same resources. The only difference is this second genus, it's not as good as staying out of water, right? Because again, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the coastline, but water goes up and down, right? Tides. So sometimes things that used to be underwater, especially things that are stuck on stuff like barnacles, they are out of water. So here, let's take a picture or take a look at the picture. So when they're together, they're competing for resources, right? Um, and then obviously when they're gone, you can see this other one, the one that's really good at staying out of, uh, staying out of the water, you can see it was really good at competing right here, right? It outcompeted the one that needs to stay wet. But obviously once you get rid of the one that needs to stay wet, then this one took over because it no longer had competition. The point is they had slightly different niches, but they did overlap a little bit. And because of that, you know, this thing wasn't able to take over, even though it did take over that spot, because these things aren't good at staying out of water. These things are. But once you took those out of the equation, what happens? Scientists did this as an experiment. Once they took these out of the equation, then we then they realized that the niche for this barnacle, this set of barnacles, was actually second. Because they didn't know that at first. They just assumed the blue ones like it here, the white ones like it there. But then again, once they took the blue ones away, there was no longer that competition, they realized. Oh yeah, the white ones, they have a much larger niche than we thought. Let me back up just so I can put this in writing for you. I'm just going to put a big old X through what everything we just said. Because I'm not going to specifically ask you about those barnacles for the exam. It's just an example. And your book has even better examples coming up. And a better term that you need to know, a better concept, which is called the competitive exclusion principle. You definitely need to know this. If two species have an ecological niche that is too similar, they can't exist at the same place. Which is basically what I just showed you. To back it up, I'll give it a second because it's still see so you can think about it. But remember, those barnacles to you, you might say, oh, they were in the same place. They were on the same rock, right? They're the same coastline. But technically, they weren't the same place, right? Because the white ones were up here, the blue ones were down there. 
So because they competed, you know, their ecological niches were too similar, they competed. And they did not contain that they didn't exist in the same place. But your book does give this example. I'm going to put it next to this too. Only because even though I'm going to give you the example, it's a great example. Um, I'm not going to ask questions about it. So here we have two different species of paramecium. I don't know if you guys know what paramecium are. They're basically single-celled organisms. They're really simple. Well, not as simple as bacteria, but anyway. What happens is they grew them in two separate cultures, right? So two, two separate dishes, if you will. And they grew them, again, they grew them separately, so they weren't competing, they weren't even touching each other. And they had a very similar um, population growth, right? You can see, by the way, it's a good time to remind you, that's a logistic population growth. Hey, Caroline, is there any way you can mute the mic? But anyway, the population is very similar. They had the same ecological niche, basically. They were given the same resources, they needed the same thing, they preferred the same temperature. All that stuff was the same. So they had very similar ecological niches. But what happens is, once you put them together, one of them is going to end up out competing the other. And that's what happened here. And what your book doesn't get into, either that or I may have accidentally left off the sides, but nature kind of takes care of this. So in nature, this wouldn't happen. In nature, it wouldn't be that the red, the red species would go up and the blue species would go down. What would happen is right about this point here, on day six, whatever it is that eats paramecians, you know, it'd be eating, well, go back. It would be eating, what did that Sorry, guys. Yeah, there we go. On day six, you know, whatever it is that's eating paramecium, or again, think about this, any species you want. If this is zebras and this is gazelles, then we can talk about lions. If the population of zebras is really increasing and they're out competing the gazelles, well, since there's so many more, uh, Zebras, the lions are going to eat more of them, right? And then they'll start going down. And basically, nature keeps these things close, right? Because whichever population out competes the other is also going to be the one that's probably going to be eaten by the predators. And again, nature takes care of it. Anyway, have any kind of questions about the uh, competitive exclusion principle? All right. Let's see. All right, we'll move forward. So that's it for interspecific competition. Next thing we're going to talk about is mutualism. I'm sure you guys have heard about this before. This is probably nothing new to you. This would be something that would be a good example of a plus plus interaction. And what you need to know for the exam is mutualism is when both species benefit. Pretty simple stuff, right? It's mutually beneficial. Mutualism. And there's even a subcategory because your book points out that sometimes this mutualism occurs between symbiotic species where there's a really close physical association. And you do need to know the symbiotic species. You need to understand that symbiotic species is a subcategory of mutualism, right? It's mutual, it is still mutualism, except it's not just like that they both benefit, it's even more than that. They kind of both rely on each other. In the book example that you get here is this root fungus. There's a lot of it, it's called mycorrhizae. There's a lot of fungus that live on different uh, the roots of different plants. And what happens is they deliver mineral nutrients to the plant and then they receive organic nutrients from the plant. So basically, I mean, they can survive without each other sometimes, but a lot of times they can't survive without each other. And that would be again, symbiotic species, right? Where they're not just mutualism, but they rely on each other. Any questions about that? All right, the other example is coral. Coral depends on algae that lives inside the cell of each coral polyp. So in case you don't know what corals are, they really, they, I don't know, some people think they're plants because they do kind of look plant-like, but they're actually aquatic animals. Another reason people think they're plants is because they don't move around. They're stationary, right? They are where they are. But um, anyway, they're not plants, but they do have algae that lives inside their cells. So what happens is, algae is just doing what algae do, right? They're photosynthesizing. Taking that carbon dioxide from the water and using the energy from the sun and creating ATP. And the byproduct is they're making sugar, right? Um, with that ATP. But that sugar is then used by the coral. What does the algae get in exchange? Well, the algae gets shelter, right? So less things are eating it. And the coral's waste products, which are carbon dioxide, as we all know from respiration, and then ammonia, which we don't talk about much, but in digestion, when you're breaking things down like proteins, that's the byproduct. And all those things are used by the, uh, the algae. Put a big X to this because, again, it's just an example. Um, I'm not going to specifically ask you about corals. 
Are there any questions about it? All right, as a matter of fact, that will be the next word for attendance. I'll just circle it right there, the big arrow next to it. Another arrow, that's the next word for attendance. So any questions? All right. If you download the PowerPoint, you can watch this video of uh, these clownfish and the sea anemone. They are very closely, uh, I won't say related, but it's a great example of mutualism. Basically, the clownfish like to swim along in the, the um, anemones, which clean them, right? So that helps the clownfish get clean, but also the anemones get to eat whatever it is that they clean off of them. But again, just an example. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you any questions about that on the exam. So that's it for mutualism. Pretty simple, right? There's no questions about mutualism. Let's talk about predation. This is, again, very, very simple. That's the one example I've been using the most anyway. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. What is predation? You need to know it for the exam. <clears throat> for the exam, it is when one species kills and eats another. Right? Specifically, generally speaking, we talk about animals when we talk about predation. If a caterpillar eats a plant, that is one species, well, we're going to kill it. That would be one species killing another, but generally speaking, when we're talking about predation, one species killing the other, generally speaking, it's animals. And as you probably know, the killer in this situation, the species that's doing the killing is called the predator. The species that is getting killed is called the prey. So as I'm sure you know, in this example, the lion is the predator, the zebra is the prey. That part's easy. The next part's a little bit more complicated, but not that much. I'm sure you're all, you're all familiar with this too. But your book points out that there are numerous adaptations for predator avoidance that have evolved in prey populations, right? So it's not just like how predators eat the prey, right? There's been evolution at work here. That's one of the reasons we think that zebras have stripes. Does anybody know? I mean, I know I just said it basically. I'm saying it prevents predation. Does anybody know specifically how the stripes help prevent predation? In a way, yeah, and because usually that's it, right? Like, uh, if you want know, to think of something that's camouflage, but when you look at that, it's like, oh, that's not camouflage. It's not that it helps it blend in to the environment, but when there's a bunch of them and they're all running around in different spots and they all have these stripes, it's just hard to like for the for the line to focus in on one because it's just a bunch of black and white blurs. Anyway, that's just a hypothesis and it's just an example, so I'm not going to ask you about it. But they, that is a great example of how they've evolved to avoid predation. There's some other examples your book gives. For example, speed. Right? <coughs> Antelopes outrun the predator. Rabbits fleeing the shelter. And this is really interesting. I wish we had more time to talk about it. But when we talk about evolution and predation and speed, basically this is how species get faster. It's not just like the antelope got faster and then the deer or the uh, lion were like, okay, I'm done here, right? Then they, you know, the lions are also evolving to be faster. Because as you get faster antelopes, the, the slower lions, they don't survive, right? They're not eating, so they don't survive. They don't pass along their genes, but the faster ones do, so they pass along their genes. So over generations, the the, uh, the populations get faster. Anyway, another example your book gives is me uh, mechanical structure. So think about porcupine quills, uh, the hard shell of a clam. Um, anyway, yeah. So any questions about speed and mechanical structures? These are all really good example or really good ideas for independent work if you're into that kind of stuff. Like you can look up some more examples of speed as a, a way to avoid predation, or mechanical structures as a way to avoid predation. Actually, that's a really interesting one as far as um, evolution is concerned. It's, you could look it up. It's about crabs, how everything kind of a lot of things separately have evolved into a crab-like form, but we don't have time to get into it. That's interesting. Just look it up if you want. Crab evolution. Anyway, the other thing that we've already talked about, but now we're going to put it in writing, is uh, cryptic coloration, aka camouflage. You need to know what that is. I'm sure you already do. And it just makes things difficult to see, right? You blend in with your surroundings. And again, going back to the zebra, sometimes blending in with your surroundings means you're blending in with your fellow zebra. Not necessarily, you know, the field that you're in. All right, um, some other examples. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna ask any questions, but these are great examples of camouflage. This one's probably the easiest. Can you see what this is? 
Yeah, so throw all on some stone, maybe some granite. And how about that? I think so, yeah. How about that one? It's a seahorse. It is hard to see, right? Plus, with the, the uh, quality of that projector, it's probably even harder. Anyway, are there any questions about camouflage? Very simple stuff. If you download the PowerPoint, um, you can watch this little video about those camouflage uh, seahorses. And while we're talking about coloration, there's also something else that I'm sure you probably are familiar with. Maybe not necessarily as familiar as uh, camouflage, but warning coloration. You need to know about that for the exam. Bright patterns of yellow, red, or orange mixed with black that marks animals with an effective chemical defense. So anything looking for a meal would see that frog and say, oh, I better not eat that. Or see that butterfly and, oh, I better not eat that, right? Because we may know that there's some sort of toxin involved. However, I did put a star next to this because they're not always toxic. And I think your book talks about that later. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, I'll come back to that. But generally speaking, one warning coloration says, hey, I'm toxic, don't eat me. And obviously, it's not always deadly. Sometimes it's just really, really disgusting. Right? So maybe like a, a snake, when it's a baby, eats one of these frogs, and it gets really sick, and it tastes horrible, but then it remembers, like, I'm, all right, I'm never going to eat anything that looks like that again. Anyway. Um, any questions so far about warning colorations? Okay, so like I said, there's a star right there because not every time that they have these colorations are they dangerous, and your book talks about that. And it's called mimicry. I should have bolded that. The word you need to know here is mimicry. That's not the attendance word. That's I'm saying this is the word you need to understand for the exam. It's basically a copycat adaptation. So it's when one species looks like another. For example, right here we have a scarlet king snake on the left and a coral snake on the right. One of them is poisonous. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. One of them is venomous, and um, one of them is not. Red on black, friend of Jack. Red on yellow, kill a fellow, as they say. But again, they just evolved to look like that. So they gain this advantage of looking like they're dangerous because the the predators don't want to eat them. Very simple stuff, right? We're just flying through this. It is very simple. Are there any questions about mimicry? Okay. Your book points out that there are some insects that kind of do both. They have protective coloration, you know, to scare things off, but they also have camouflage. Um, and we're going to talk about them separately. These, again, are just examples. I'm not going to ask you about one exam, but you know, I'm sure you guys have seen those insects that look like twigs. A lot of them look like leaves. Some of them look like bird droppings, right? It's also they can camouflage themselves and it, uh, blend into their environment so they're not eaten. Um, some of them have both. And that's an example of these caterpillars. I'm not even going to read it. I'll just show you. I'm not going to ask you any questions about it. One of those is a caterpillar. One of them is a snake. I mean, obviously, when you actually have a picture of a snake, it's kind of obvious that that's the one on the right. But this is the caterpillar. So on one end of it, if it were to flip over, it would be camouflaged. It would blend in with its environment. But if that doesn't work and it's starting to get attacked, it flips over because it does kind of look like a snake. Uh, but again, let's put a big old X to this because this is just an example. I'm sure this is stuff you're all familiar with. But again, it's, there's so many good examples of this. So if you're interested in it, it would be a great idea for independent work. Anyway, are there any questions about predation? or the colors, the, the ways that things have evolved to avoid predation. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is also a plus negative, and it is herbivory. And I'm sure you already know what this is too. It's the consumption of plant parts or algae by an animal. It's pretty specific. So if anything else eats, eats a plant, we don't call it herbivory. I guess it's not technically eating if it's not an animal. But yeah, herbivory is eating plants. I'm sure you already know that. And I gave the example earlier, you know, I said, oh yeah, if a, if a caterpillar eats this plant and kills it, we don't call it predation, even though it's one species killing the other, we call it herbivory. But also I should point out, like I did then, and now it's in writing to remind you, usually it's not fatal, right? Usually um, an, an herbivore doesn't kill and eat the whole plant. Sometimes it does. Again, good, good concept for uh, independent work if you want to get to it. When is it fatal? 
what species usually kills the plant or what plant species usually gets killed. So just like when we talk about predation, we said that things have evolved ways to avoid predation. Same thing with herbivory. Plants have evolved defenses. And I think some of this is interesting, and I'm sure you're already, again, familiar with this. Spines, right? So when you think about uh, cacti, that's a good example. Thorns, so when you think about roses. Uh, trichomes, which a lot of people don't think, they don't know what those are, but you know, you ever see plants that are a little bit fuzzy? Looks like they have hair. Obviously, it's not hair because the plants are not mammals, but yeah, those are the trichomes. And of course, chemical toxins. Um, those are just examples. I'm not going to, well, I don't know if I asked you that or not, but. You definitely need to know what herbivory is, and you should definitely recognize some of the some of the ways the plants have evolved to um, avoid it. Again, some examples: a thorny rose, rose, a rose bush, spiky cactus, uh, trop, a poison produced by a tropical vine, or think about like even speaking of poison on a plant, uh, poison ivy. Right? I'm sure you're you're familiar with poison ivy. But it gets interesting. I'll put a little line through here. So those are all good examples, but everything below that little dotted line would be examples of how humans have used this, right? So we use, even though morphines, uh, you know, opiums produce morphine as a way to avoid being eaten, um, humans were like, hey, that'll get us high, right? So then we start growing poppies for morphine. Same thing with nicotine. Nicotine from tobacco. Nicotine is a pesticide. But humans are like, ooh, I like that buzz, so... Let's grow, cultivate tobacco. Um, and then your book gets really broad and says, you know, there's a lot of defensive compounds that are not even toxic to humans, but we like the way they taste, right? So peppermint, clove, cinnamon, all these flavors, they're there for a reason. They've evolved to help um, reduce herbivory, which is ironic because then humans are like, oh, that tastes really good. Let's eat it. Which you could argue, though, when humans like something, it actually helps them because we cultivate it, right? So, you know, you might have had a few wild yeah, clove plants because humans like it, or tobacco, right? Because humans like it, we grow it. So evolutionarily, I guess it's helpful. Just not the way intended. I can't really say it intended because there's no intention, but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, this is another good example, uh, or another good topic for independent work if you want to get into it. Like THC, the stuff that gets you high in marijuana, that was, uh, evolved as a, a way to reduce a herbivory. Or does anybody know what capsaicin is? That's a really good example. It's one of my favorites. Is it spicy? Yeah, it's the stuff that makes pepper spicy. So, you know, like ghost peppers have a lot of them. Jalapenos have a little bit of them. But it's interesting because I'm sure you guys have had hot peppers, right? It burns your mouth. You know whose mouth it doesn't burn? Birds. So birds can eat hot peppers, doesn't bother them. The reason being, and I'm not going to ask you this on the example on the exam, but you know, these plants want their seeds, their seeds spread, right? So the peppers, it's basically just a thing holding seeds. So they want the peppers to be eaten by the birds, so that the birds can fly around and spread the seeds. That's good for the plant. And they don't want some ground dwelling mammal to eat it and then just poop, you know, like three feet away from it, and they didn't really get to spread the seeds. So because of that. Again, mammals and humans, for example, right, we find them hot. And other mammals try to avoid them. Humans are weird. Um, but anyway, that's just an example. Here's some pictures of some of these examples. There's some peppermint at the top left, there's some cloves to the top right. Down here is the bark of the cinnamon, or you know, they peel the bark off, and that's where we get cinnamon. Uh, just some, some of the many examples. So, are there any questions about herbivory or the things that plants have done to uh, evolve to avoid herbivory? All right, the next one I'm pretty sure you're familiar with too. Parasitism and pathogens. So you need to know this. Parasites are something that live on a host or in a host from which they obtain nutrients. This is another example of a plus minus, right? It's beneficial for the parasite. It's harmful for the host. Your book gives a few examples. Tapeworms, roundworms, ticks, lice, mosquitoes, uh, fleas. Again, if you're interested in it, a fine topic for independent work. Name some other parasites. And even though your book doesn't get into it too much, I'm not going to ask about it on the exam. It is an interesting evolution on this too as well, because parasites, they, have, they walk a thin line, right? So a lot of times you think of parasites as being bad, and it is bad for the host species, 
But generally speaking, it's not deadly because that wouldn't benefit benefit the uh, the parasite, right? The parasite is trying to live off of the host. So if the host dies, the parasite's done too. Like if you get a tapeworm, you know, the tapeworm needs you alive and eating so it meets your nutrients. If you die, so does the tapeworm. Anyway, those are parasites. The next thing we talk about is pathogens. So it's basically anything that causes disease that's living anyway. Or no, I shouldn't even say that because the virus is on the list too. I don't know what I was thinking. So bacteria, viruses, fungi, protists. And these, by the way, in case you didn't know, are all kingdoms, right? So that was a very broad, those are very broad examples from your book. That'll also be the next word for attendance since I'm writing it down. Kingdom. So yeah, if you want to, if you want to look this up for independent work, which bacteria cause disease? Because they don't all cause disease. We have some in us. So we need some bacteria. Obviously vi uh, viruses. That looks a little bit more straightforward. Fungi, right? Some fungi are good. Some fungi we eat. Some of them cause diseases. Protists. So you can look all that up if you want. Because again, kingdoms. These are just kingdoms. It's very broad. There's specific species that are uh, disease causing. Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right, the last one for interspecific interactions is commensalism. This is not very difficult, but in my opinion, it's the least. Um, you've probably heard about this least. You've probably heard about every single one of these, but you maybe not have heard about commensalism. Commensalism, it's not a plus negative or a plus plus or a negative negative. It's more of a plus zero. This is when one species benefits and the other is not helped or harmed. Um, and you see your book gives this example of the seahorse that benefits by matching the coral to hide. Um, there's no cost or benefit to the coral to have this seahorse near it. So again, that's just one example and a great topic for independent work. If you want to look up some more examples of commensalism, you can look them up. But there's not much to say about commensalism. It's actually a little bit rare because there's usually some sort of benefit. Even if it's a small benefit, there's usually some sort of benefit. When, uh, or, excuse me. When two species interact, is either some sort of benefit or harm, even if it's very small, very often or very rarely is it actually do one. So you can look that up again for an independent work if you want. So again, before we move forward, here it is in one big um, one big table. If we're talking about interspecific interactions, um, we know competition is negative for both. We know that and this is what you need to know for the exam, mutualism is good for both. We know that predation is obviously good for one, bad for the other. Herbivory, good for one, bad for the other. And parasites, good for one, bad for the other. And of course, the one that's not on this chart, the one we just talked about, which is commensalism, which is good for one, neutral for the other. So for the exam, most likely the question was going to be, I give you an example, like this animal ate this animal. What is this an example of? And you would say predation. Or I'd say, this animal is competing against that animal. What is this an example of? You would say competition. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward stuff. I'm feeling much really, really good on the exam for this chapter. <coughs> so, excuse me. Are there any questions about interspecific interactions? Before we move on to our next main bullet point. All right. So, the next thing we're talking about is trophic structure. And a lot of this you're going to be familiar with, too. It's going to get pretty specific at the end. Uh, but the beginning of this is going to be concepts that you're probably already familiar with. Or maybe I'll be giving you words that you didn't hear before, but you're like, oh yeah, you knew this, I just didn't know that was what it was called. So the first thing we're talking about, the first thing you need to know for the exam for this is what trophic structure is. That is the feeding relationships among species in a community. So in other words, like what eats what, right? So the lion eats the zebra, the zebra eats the, the grass. Uh, Grasshoppers are also eating the grass, right? So it's what eats what. And obviously, knowing that the trophic structure is describing what eats what, the trophic structure then determines the passage of energy and nutrients from plants to herbivores to predators. So like I said, the uh, zebra eats the grass, the lion eats the zebra. Of course, I put a little star next to this. Any, any guesses? Like there's an exception here to that word plants. Anybody guess what the exception might be? 
That's okay. Anything photosynthetic, right? So we're already familiar with algae, right? Those are not plants. Um, or phytoplankton in, in the ocean, right? Not plants, but still photosynthetic. Um, anyway, so the sequence of transfer between trophic cells is what you're probably already familiar with, which is called the food chain. So again, food, the trophic structure is again looking at all over, looking at the big picture, what eats what. And if we talk about it going from plants to herbivores to predators, you know, up the chain, that's what we call it, the food chain. Any questions? All right, your book gives two examples of two different food chains. One of them is aquatic, one of them is terrestrial, as in one of them is in the water, um, and one of them is on land. These are examples, right? So I'm not going to ask you any questions specifically about these different species. But you can see here, like I said, phytoplankton, that's a, it's not a plant, but it is a photosynthetic organism that is eaten by a primary consumer. And these words right here, I'm going to teach you later. Primary consumer, secondary, tertiary, for now. Don't worry about those words, we'll come to it. The point is, it's a food chain, right? We have a photosynthetic organism that's feeding something that eats it, then something eats that thing, and something eats that thing, and something eats that thing, so on and so forth. Whether you're talking terrestrial or aquatic, that's always the way it works. Right? But the words you do need to know, again, I'll teach you these words later, tertiary, secondary, blah, blah, blah. The words you do need to know are producer and consumer. So down here at the bottom are the producers, right? the photosynthetic organisms that are turning sunlight, the energy from sunlight, and the carbon dioxide in the air, right? and they're making things with it, and everything else is a consumer. So here we have producers at the bottom and consumers right here. And remember, you already knew this because I taught you this when we started talking about photosynth uh, photosynthesis and respiration. And I taught you all this stuff, the difference between a uh, consumer and a producer and an autotroph and a heterotroph. And I told you, don't worry about this for now, but you're going to need to know it later in the semester. So here we are later in the semester. You need to know the difference between a producer and a consumer. So are there any questions about the difference between a producer and a consumer? Wait, so is a producer always going to be like some type of plant? Or... Yep, always something photosynthetic. Yeah. So algae, flower, phyto phytoplankton, uh, cyanobacteria, anything that's photosynthetic. Or, and again, this might come up later in this chapter, I assume it would have to, Another way to think about it is the way we talked about it in chapter six. There's the phototrophs, which are these things, right? They don't eat anything. They take the energy from the sun and the nutrients they're given and they build stuff, right? They build their own glucose, for example. And then there's everything else that eats other things. It's a great question. A producer is basically something that produces its own stuff, its own food. Which is kind of weird to think about because I don't think a lot of people think about plants that way unless you're thinking about it in the you know, context of the biology class. Because you think, all right, plants need fertilizers and soil, and sometimes you might think that that's the food for the plant, but it's not. Plants make their own food. They just take the, the minerals that they get from the uh, fertilizer and the soil and all that, and they use that to produce their own food. Any other questions? All right, the place, uh, the, the, the concept that makes it a little bit more confusing would be this. Does it seem like it when I'm showing it right here? It seems pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, quaternary consumer, it all seems pretty straightforward, because it is, but it is easy to mess, uh, miss in the exam. But again, herbivores are what we call primary consumers because those are the things that are eating in this case the plants let's just simplify and talk about plants and not worry about uh phytoplankton or anything like that so herbivores are called primary consumers they eat plants above that we have carnivores that eat those consumers then we have secondary consumers tertiary consumers quantity just like i said earlier it's all part of the food chain the part that people usually miss on the exam is i might say you know a grasshopper eats a plant, and a, and a bat eats the grasshopper. What is the bat? And the multiple choice would be, you know, uh, is it a producer? Is it a primary consumer, secondary consumer, quaternary consumer? So you just need to count, right? How many steps is it away from the producer? So if it's the thing that eats the producer, it is a primary consumer. If it's the thing that eats that, it's the secondary consumer. 
if it's the thing that eats the secondary consumer, it's a tertiary, so on and so forth. I don't know how, but this is often this is one of the most quit, most missed questions on the exam. And I don't think I don't write it to be tricky. It is. And of course, this picture is not from your book, and I like, and uh, we don't really have time to talk too much about it, but we haven't said anything about this yet. Like the fungi and the bacteria, all the things that are decomposing everything. But we'll get there. Actually, yeah, we'll get there on the next slide. So if there's no questions about this slide, we'll move on to the next one. The stuff that eats dead things, right? Because some consumers derive energy from detritus, so dead stuff. So, again, if you're an herbivore, you're a primary consumer. You're eating a live plant. If you're a carnivore, you're eating something else alive. But there are some things that eat the dead stuff. And you need to know that. And we call them, well, there's three of them. Scavengers, detritivores, and decomposers. I don't know why I only bolded decomposers, but you need to know each of these. So scavengers eat dead stuff, but we're talking about like the whole dead body, right? So a vulture, a crow, a hyena, right? That's looking for dead bodies. Like, oh, this is a dead body, I'm gonna go eat it. So scavenger's a lot like a, a predator, except it doesn't do the killing, right? It's still eating a whole dead body, but just didn't do the killing. Then you get a step down, which are the detritivores, Things like earthworms, millipedes, etc., they consume decaying organic matter. So, you know, not a whole body, but smaller parts of it. And then you got the decomposers, which are actually even smaller, and they secrete enzymes to digest molecules and convert organic materials into inorganic forms. So, in a sense, you can just think about this in, as far as size is concerned, right? So, you go larger to smaller. Just remember, scavengers are the largest, the detritivores are the decomposers. A good way to help you remember this would be a compost bin. Does anybody have any questions about the slide before I move forward? All right. So, again, a compost bin, if you're not familiar with it, that's where people, you know, usually they'll put out their leftover food and things break them down. Obviously, there's no scavengers involved in this. But You've got the uh, detritivores that are first going to break this stuff down. This is pretty big stuff. And the detritivores break it down. And then from there, then you get the decomposers breaking down their waste. And it's all the way down to an organic material. So, any questions? Could you back Yeah. Another thing, since you're looking at this, I will put it next to these. Because I'm not going to ask you examples of decomposers. I'm not going to say, you know, Here's some prokaryotes and fungi. Are they decomposers, detritivores, or scavengers? Matter of fact, I'm probably not going to ask you any questions anyway. But if I do, I'm not going to ask you, you know, what is an earthworm? What is a crow? All right, before we move forward, might as well, uh, the next word for tunes is dead. All right. The next one, while we're talking about trophic structures, let's talk about biological magnification. Uh, this first bullet point, you don't necessarily need to write down, it's just an introduction. But your book points out that organisms cannot metabolize a lot of toxins. Meaning, if a lot of organisms eat the toxins, they don't break them down, right? If you eat starch, you metabolize it, right? It's not a toxin. You turn that starch, there's things in your body that turn that starch into glucose, if you remember way back in chapter three when we were talking about um, polymers and monomers, right? If you eat proteins, right, your body breaks them down, so it's no longer a protein, it breaks them down into the different amino acids. If you eat toxins, right, assuming it doesn't kill you, a lot of organisms, they just can't break it down. So if they eat mercury, for example, it's going to stay as mercury. You, you, the, the organism's not going to break it down, it's also not going to expel it. So because of that, these uh, toxins become more concentrated as they pass through the food chain, and that is something we call biological magnification. And you do need to know that for the exam. So in a sense, the most simple way you can think of this is because of the fact that when things eat these toxins, they can't get rid of them and they can't break them down. Because of that, the higher you get up on the food chain, the more toxins there are, because they're more concentrated. And I'll give you an example on the next slide when we get to it. But for now, are there any questions? About this side, and any questions about what biological magnification is? All right, let's talk about give you an example PCBs. So you guys have all done the 
hopefully you've, hopefully you've all done the uh, the lab from last week, right, where you talked about the poisoned waters. And it just so happens this is what we're talking about, right? The PCBs. So what happens is zooplankton, they're just floating around. They're basically filter feeders, and there's a little bit of PCBs in the water, so they get a little bit of them. For example, one nanogram of, uh, of PCBs was really, really, really small per gram of zooplankton. But there are a little bit in them. And then you have these cod that eat them, right? They're not filter feeding, so they're getting this. It's a little bit more concentrated. Therefore, they have 10 nanograms per gram if you were to look at the body of the, of the cod. Then the things that eat them is salmon, and it goes up to 90 nanograms per gram. And then finally, humans can eat salmons, and then you can get any breast milk, and it's up to 350 nanograms per gram. Um, I'm going to definitely put a big old X to this. It's just an example. I'm not going to ask you about it, especially those numbers, right? But the point here, again, what you need to know for the exam is, if we're talking about these toxins, they get concentrated. So the lower you are on the food chain, the lower concentration. The higher you are, the higher concentration. Now, I don't know, uh, I've asked you this before, but I know none of you women have children here, but I'm sure you know some people, but I'm sure you've also heard that you're not supposed to eat tuna or swordfish. And this is the reason why, right? Because of biomagnification. Usually it's mercury, I think, that they worry about with that. Anyway, any questions about biomagnification? Last thing to point out for today, this is also very, very simple, is the fact that I keep talking about a food chain, but it's not this simple, right? If you were to look in the Puget Sound, it's not like the only thing that lives is zooplankton, the only thing that eats them is cod, and the only thing that eats them is salmon, right? It's not that complicated, it's not that simple. It's not as simple as a food chain. It is actually a food web. So, yeah, I'm sure you already knew what a food web is. Basically, we're saying, all right, now that I've taught you about a food chain, let's be more realistic. It's not one species to one species to one species. It's actually a whole community woven into elaborate food webs, which brings us to a new term that you need to know, which is omnivore. So you know herbivores eat plants, carnivores eat other animals, omnivores eat both. And I'm sure you already knew that. And that is where we will leave it for today. Pretty simple stuff. Anyway, yeah, so tomorrow or Wednesday when we come back, we will jump into species diversity. All right, does anybody have any questions before I stop recording? So don't forget, you two were here on time. Don't forget the email to remind me. Because I remember, maybe I'll get to my office, but no guarantees. Email me right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the last thing I wanted to point out is that the Waiting at the door, but I don't see anybody.